to everyone who's currently on the call. Um, I realize other people will join um, as we as we proceed, but seeing as you all have made it early, um, I think it's fair that we start now and the others can join the call as we proceed. Uh, well, my name is Guchuku Chukujiaka. I'm the founder and CEO of Energy Talents Company. And today I will be the host and the moderator of this webinar. We have some very exciting speakers on this webinar, but before we go into it, let's quickly run through what the agenda will be for this webinar. Next slide, please. So I would run through some quick introductions uh, about Energy Talents Company, after which we would have Anita Otubu um, come on. And after that, Sylvia uh, from Daystar Power will come on and then Uzo. At the end of this, we would make time for questions and answers. So as they go through their slides, please, if you have questions, you can either note it down somewhere or put it in the comment section. And at the end of this, I will read out the questions and they will respond. And if your question is directed to a specific person, please note who you want to uh, respond to that question. So we would have each person go through their slides first. And at the end of their presentation, then we would go through uh, uh, question and answer. Yeah. Next slide, please. So yeah, so basically Energy Talent Company, we're a global energy talent accelerator. And what we do is we train and we help hire solar talent to solar company based on the skills and knowledge needs of these companies and also the values, right? Because that's important. And the way we hire out solar companies, we hire out on a short-term project basis or a medium to long-term employment contract, right? And we pride ourselves in the fact that the quality of talent that come out of our program at the end of the program are to global standards. They have a higher professional uh, uh, question, and we provide continuous professional development with them throughout their time with us. And we also, at the end of the training program, we place them with solar companies, as I've stated. Now, for solar companies, they basically have access to a very well trained and well prepared talent that suits their needs, whether it's from a skill or knowledge of values um, basis. So also, um, the hiring process is a lot more efficient. So for example, if you're a company, if you're a company and you're moving from, let's say one state in Nigeria to another state, or even from one country, in, in, from a country to another country, say from Nigeria to Ghana, right? We help walk you through that process and we help provide talent in different states and in different countries. And I'll talk a bit more about our innovative training program where we are able to- so Again, energy talents this thing by three. So they don't yeah. have three, so they don't connect you me. Mute your mic, please. Now that online this thing. Sorry about that. Um, and I'll talk through our innovative training programs um, and why our program um, is able to bring global talents for, for the solar industry in Africa. Um, next slide. So our program is basically broken into three phases. Um, the first phase is our foundational introductory program. And off of this phase is when we decide or select the people who will go into the more in-depth specialization program, right? And we basically have a very high uh, expectation or cutoff for the foundational phase. So if you do well in the foundational phase, you qualify for the specialization program. Now the specialization program is a combination of both online, offline and apprenticeship. And at the end of that program is when you go on to, you know, being held hired or hired out to solar companies. Uh, next slide. Now we are quite obsessive about learning. Right, so we're not just providing a training program, you know, that's been thought of in one week and, and put together. Um, within the team, we have expertise across um, learning, learning sciences, technology, you know, instructional design, curriculum design, electrical engineering, renewable energy engineering, a host of things, right? And so this is our model. And our model is based on what we know to be best practice for how adults learn 
right? And it's backed by years and years of research. But beyond research, it's also backed by field practice. Now, I'm not going to go into the detail of this, except if we have some educators on the, on the webinar. But basically, this is our model, and this is what we run eternally, right? And all members of the team at different times, at, in different uh, 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 institutions, have had or tried out this uh, research backed model in different ways and different forms. And we brought all of our experiences into energy talent company to ensure that we're able to train people to the highest possible um, global standard uh, uh, that's currently obtainable. Next slide. So you go back. Thank you. Um, so one other thing we are quite obsessive about is, you know, you, you only get better at the things you track, right? So not only do we track our own processes, but we track our learners, right? So this is just a high level view of the foundational um, skills and what the learner skills look like, right? So we track the skills of our learners, we track some of the values, the things we see them do both during the training, whether it's online, offline, or on the field during apprenticeship, we track all of that data and consistently improve it. Where we see weaknesses, as you can see with this data point of average, you know, we're constantly looking at that for the, for the learner or for the talent and improving on that skill. So this is where we're able to deliver um, the quality of training uh, we're able to deliver. We're obsessive about learning, we're obsessive about data, and our goal is to ensure that any learner who's gone through our program in any part of the world will be able to excel. Next slide. So we're now going to go into our speakers who are going to take us through this webinar. So I'll start off by introducing Anita. So Anita Otugu is currently the head of program management unit of the Nigerian Electrification Project, the NEP. Uh, she's a qualified lawyer and certified project manager with over 10 years of professional experience in sectors including electrical power, oil and gas, and climate change. She was previously the head of special projects in the Rural Electrification Agency, providing program management services to the development and implementation of the Energizing Education Program. She was also a former member of the advisory power team in the office of the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. A technical assistant legal to it is technical assistant legal technical assistant to a minister of power and her services have also been engaged by the national assembly transition company of nigeria or transmission company of nigeria british petroleum west africa nigerian national petroleum corporation nnpc federal ministry of environment federal ministry of works and housing and the cardinal state government to name a few Anita was recently appointed as a member of the advisory board of the Universal Energy Facility. With a passion for climate change, Anita is also a non-executive board member of Changa Dati Recycling Company. So without further ado, let's have Anita take us through the um, rest of it. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you Energy Talent Company for this opportunity to come and present today. Um, I really do feel honored. So um, yes, as mentioned, I'm head of the project management unit of the Nigeria Electrification Project, which is a program being implemented by the Rural Electrification Agency here in Nigeria. Next slide, please. Okay, so before we talk about uh, policies, regulations, financial interventions put in place, by the federal government of Nigeria um, towards addressing uh, the power sector in the country, it's important for us to actually look at these challenges. What are the electricity challenges in this country? So at the moment, the current national peak demand is estimated at 25,719 megawatts. So essentially this is the amount of power that will be required in order for uh, there to be access to power across the, the entire country. Total installed capacity, however, is just 12,522 megawatts. And with this total installed capacity, we're only generating about 6,800. And by the time it gets distributed, we're only distributing about 3,800 megawatts. 80 million people are lacking access to grid electricity. 
So there is a major challenge. As we all know, I don't even need to tell you this. You all know what you experience on a daily basis. To provide some more statistics um, of the rural population, just 36% of them are actually uh, powered or have access to electricity. And in the northeastern region, only 26.7% of the population have access to power. Next slide, please. So in addition to just having 45% of uh, the country electrified, Nigeria has the largest access deficit in sub-Saharan Africa and the second largest in the world, after, and is the second largest, or has the second largest in the world after India. So what are the issues? What, why do we have such a large um, access deficit? It can be subcategorized into uh, uh, constraints, including hydro level challenges, low grid demand, uh, inadequate infrastructure, uh, TCM misalignment, and most importantly, financial constraints, not having the available funds required to, to um, uh, rehabilitate the, or revamp the power sector. Next slide, please. So what has federal government, what has the federal government of Nigeria done as a result to uh, address these challenges that I've just met, uh, I've just um, mentioned? And I'm not just going to say this because I, I work with the federal government of Nigeria. Um, I honestly believe that uh, a lot of effort has been made by the federal government of Nigeria uh, across the past few years to address the challenges. Um, but I guess, you know, a lot more can be done. In 2005, so starting off with what I feel to be uh, the most important um, act that has been established by, by the federal government of Nigeria towards addressing uh, this, uh, the electricity challenges um, was the enactment of the Electric Power Sector Reform Act of 2005. With this act, we were able to privatize the sector. Now, when the federal government of Nigeria privatized the sector, they did this believing that private sector will be able to attract the much needed investment needed. You know, I mentioned that you know, financial constraints is the issue as to why we're having um, electricity challenges. So believing that having private sector get involved, they can bring in the much needed investment and we'll be able to revamp the, private, the power sector in order to ensure that we have universal access to electricity and that the electricity that we're already receiving um, is adequate as well and it is sufficient to meet our, our daily needs. With this electric power sector format, as well as privatizing the sector, uh, it also established the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission, uh, which essentially regulates players in the Nigerian electricity markets, allows for, for private sector companies to participate in the generation and distribution of, of power that's been generated. It also established the Rural Electrification Agency, which I mentioned um, I work under, which, was, um, which has the mandate to increase access to electricity in unserved and underserved rural communities uh, via grid extension projects and renewable energy projects, off-grid projects, etc. I'm not going to mention all of the policies and regulations put in place, but I've highlighted in yellow those that I believe to be very important, especially in the off-grid space. So in 2008, the regulator, NERC, uh, issued permits for captive power generation uh, regulation. Now, what is this regulation? It essentially allows for uh, companies to embark upon uh, building their own power plants to generate power for its own consumption. So this is where uh, you have the opportunity to build a power plant. So long as you're not selling the power to a third party, it's really just for your own consumption to meet your own power needs. This regulation allows for um, individuals or companies to embark upon this. And because of this regulation, uh, the Energizing Education Program, uh, which, which, which I had, um, was able to, to be issued captive permits. So the universities were able to build power plants for, to, to generate power for its own consumption. Moving on to 2012, um, NERC also issued what they call the Independent Electricity Distribution Network, as well as the Embedded Generation, uh, sorry, the Independent Electricity Distribution Network Regulation, as well as the Embedded Generation Regulation. So this allows for private sector again to come in uh, to uh, build independent power plants build its own independent distribution network to supply power to a particular end user. 
upon obviously meeting the necessary um, criteria requirements in these regulations. Because of this regulation, there was a project I also worked on under Rural Electrification Agency called the Energizing Economies Initiative. It allowed for us to build power plants in uh, economic clusters such as markets. So for example, Auraria market being the largest of markets in Nigeria with 37,000 shops, we're able to build a gas fired power plant dedicated to providing power to that particular market because of these regulations, right? Now you have 2015 where the National Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Policy was launched. This uh, somewhat was birthed as a result of entering into the Paris Agreement, which well, the federal government of Nigeria entering into this Paris, Paris Agreement, uh, which essentially uh, obligated or mandated Nigeria to increase access to electricity by using renewable energy sources and promoting energy efficiency as well. Uh, and so essentially this policy um, uh, promotes and encourages uh, that uh, energy access deficit to be, to be bridged through um, mini grid, solar home systems, and other off grid renewable energy solutions. And in 2016, um, the very, very important mini grid regulation was uh, developed by uh, NERC, and I believe it was issued in 2017. And this allowed for projects like the Nigeria Electrification Project that I'm working on, that we'll speak more about later on, um, the Rural Electrification Fund, which is under REA, GIZ, and a number of other development partners. Um, to, to embark upon projects that allows for private sector companies, companies to identify communities uh, that are not connected to the grid. Um, are, are, they need the power, they're willing to pay, they're able to pay to build these mini grids to supply power directly to meet their needs. Um, so this mini grid regulation, I, I, I can say I'm very proud of. Um, there aren't many African countries uh, that have uh, such a regulation and, and, and it's been emulated by, by, by other African countries as we speak. And then 2017, um, NERC issued the eligible customers regula regulation. So this allows for bilateral agreements. So a generation company can supply power directly to uh, a particular customer, right? So long as that customer has been declared as an eligible customer, the customer would have to require a certain uh, amount of power, right? So, so long as you meet the certain requirements, criteria in, in, in that regulation, you can literally have that agreement with a generation company. So you don't even have to bother with, you know, NVET or distribution company or anything like that. Um, so yeah, a lot has been done in the policy and regulation space towards addressing electricity challenges. And I've just given you a snapshot of some of, of those efforts. Moving on to the next slide, please. So in addition to the policies, as well as the regulations that have been put in place to address electricity challenges, federal government of Nigeria has also embarked upon a lot of uh, financial interventions. And it's important for me to note that uh, what I'm going to speak about here right now is exclusive of the yearly national budget allocations or contributions that have been made by federal government of Nigeria to address uh, the electricity challenges. In 2015, and again, even, what I'm, uh, these interventions are just a, num uh, a few of the interventions that I feel um, have been pretty instrumental in trying to, to address the issues that we face on a daily basis in, in the, in the NESA. So uh, 2015, the Central Bank of Nigeria uh, Electricity Market sta Stabilization Facility um, was issued and it was issued to settle shortfalls and debts um, of the Nigerian electricity market's key players. So the generation company, for example, uh, transmission company and vet, um, the distribution companies, uh, a lot of, because of um, issues to do with collections, not being able to really um, uh, collect the funds that that, that is due, um, you know, we have been unable to pay um, the market players in the sector. So a federal government had to do something about it towards somewhat stabilizing the market. In 2018, um, 350 million US dollars was put aside for the Nigeria electrification project, which I'm going to speak about uh, later on. Um, it was provided by a, a World Bank loan facility. Um, and in 2019, 200 million was also put aside for the same project, but this time by the African Development Bank. Uh, 486 million US dollars was put aside for the Nigeria electricity transmission project, which we call uh, up. Um, and then in 2020, which is the current year that we're in, 
750 million US dollars was put aside for the power sector recovery of Croatia. And then 240 billion Naira has been put aside for the recently launched 5 million solar power Niger project. I can talk a little bit about this. Uh, this is where a federal government is providing low interest loans. I'm talking single digit interest loans uh, to local companies, right? Nigerian companies to embark upon both upstream and downstream uh, projects in, in the power, uh, in the renewable energy space. So for example, if you want to build a manufacturing slash assembling plant for PV panels, batteries and the likes, you can get up to 70% for your business. If you want to embark upon deploying solar home systems or building mini grids, again, you can get up to 70% uh, loan facility for your business. And like I said, it attracts just, uh, you know, if, if, if you apply before February, I believe it's 5% uh, interest, thereafter 9%. And this is towards building local content, towards in, uh, increasing or providing more jobs uh, for, for, for Nigerians in Nigeria um, and the likes. And then in 2021, next year, um, there's a new project that's about to come out a distribution sector recovery program. As you know, uh, there's a lot, lot of work to be done on our distribution network in order to improve access and uh, reliability of power uh, to our households and, and micro, small, medium-sized enterprises or just businesses in, in general. Uh, 500 million US dollars has been put aside for, for this program. So a lot of interventions, uh, the government is trying, is it enough? I mean, that's a question for, that's a, 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 a a question rather for, for the public to, to answer. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the Nigeria Electrification Project, which is the project that I'm currently heading. And this really focuses on the opportunities that are available. We've spoken about challenges, now we're on to opportunities. So um, the Nigeria Electrification Project, firstly, is funded, as I mentioned earlier, by the World Bank and the African Development Bank for a total amount, with a total amount of 550 million US dollars put aside. Um, there are actually five components. We have the first component being the solar hybrids mini, the solar hybrid mini grids component. I'll speak about all of them individually. We have the standalone solar home systems component. We have the energizing education program component. We also have the appliances for productive use com uh, component and then technical assistance. So uh, going on to moving on to this, what's before us right now, solar hybrid mini grids component. There are three sub components under this component, what we call the minimum subsidy tender, performance based grants and COVID-19 and beyond initiative. So with the minimum subsidy tender, this is where we as government, rural electrification agency identifies a number of communities uh, located in places where there's no access or presence of the national grid. Um, we carry out the necessary feasibility studies, stakeholder engagements, and so on. And then we put these communities into clusters, um, into portfolios, right? And then we ask companies that have technical and financial capacity to come and bid. Now, we only provide subsidies to, for these projects. We don't provide the entire project cost. It's not an EPC, right? The idea is that these um, communities, these projects, essentially will form part of your business. So we'll provide you with a subsidy and you will provide the, the, the counterpart funding required and make your profit from uh, the end user at the end of the day. So the reason why we provide these grant subsidies is so as to make um, this business attractive to the private sector developers and to make it affordable to the end users. So that's why we provide subsidies. So with the minimum subsidy tender, as I mentioned, we identify the communities, we ask companies to bid, and uh, it's based on the company that requires the minimum subsidy, and obviously based on their technical um, proposal as well. The performance-based grant component, this is where you as a private developer comes to uh, the REA and says, look, I've identified um, a community or a couple of communities that don't have presence of the grid, these guys are using diesel generators or candles or whatnot. They've shown or they've been able to demonstrate that they can pay for power. Um, they have some form of economic activity going on, whether it's agricultural activities or whatever it is, we think they're viable. Um, and we would like to build a mini grid there and we would need your support. There's a certain criteria that you have to meet. It, it's not so stringent because we want as much participation as possible. Uh, so for example, number one, 
you would only have to show evidence of having built one mini grid that's currently in operation before you can be admitted onto the project. Thereafter, we enter into a, a grant agreement with you where we say, after, you know, within 12 months, you should have built these mini grids. And then upon successful completion of these mini grids, right, we pay you 40% of the agreed amount. And then after 90 days of successful supply of power from these mini grids to the households or MSMEs, we pay you 60%. Why are we not paying up on money? Nigeria has a history of abandoned projects. Or so, uh, projects that are completed for little work. Be sure that whatever we're investing in, it's actually you know of good standard and quality, and will achieve the purpose in which in which it's been built for. Um, in this instance, under the performance-based grants, we pay you three hundred and fifty US dollars per connection. So every household you connect, we pay you three fifty. It's about thirty percent of the cost of a connection. So obviously, the more households, MSMEs, um, etc., that you connect to your mini grid. The more funding that you can get, and if you if you you also use this to apply for uh, funding under the five mid the, the solar night solar power Niger program that I mentioned earlier, where you can get the low interest loan, um, and and you can create this blended finance, it, it makes it even easier for you to embark upon this kind of. So for you to mute your your mics, please. Okay, and then. Third, can you please put your mics on mute? Thank you. And thirdly, we have the COVID-19 and Beyond Initiative, which wasn't initially part of this program, but obviously we're all faced with this pandemic and, and it's important for us to do our part. So this way we're powering uh, 100 treatment and isolation centers and 400 primary healthcare centers with containerized solar hybrid systems. Uh, with 100 isolation and treatment centers, it, because it was an emergency situation, it was, it, it, we adopted a restricted uh, bidding uh, a, a approach, um, but with the 400 primary healthcare centers, it's going to be international competitive bidding, national, international companies, they, they all have the opportunity to come and bid to provide uh, these solutions. So in, let me just quickly talk about our achievements so far. We've commissioned three of these sites. Uh, we've entered into 59 grant agreements. Um, as a result of the agreements that we've entered into, we've been able to uh, connect or make 1,054 connections. So moving on to the next slide, please. I'm conscious of my time. I'll try and, and speak as quickly as possible. So these are some examples of, well, these are three of the mini grids uh, that we have commissioned. Actually, we've completed more than three. It's just that we've uh, politically commissioned three, uh, but we have about five at the moment and a lot in, in, in the pipeline. As I mentioned, 59 agreements we've, we've entered into, so we, we expect to see 59 uh, mini grids. Uh, moving on to the next slide, please. Okay, then we have the standalone solar home systems component. Uh, and under this component, we have two subcomponents, what we call the, the market scale up challenge fund and output based fund. Um, first of all, to mention that we hope to uh, power 300,000 households with these solar home systems and 40,000 MSMEs. So with the Output-based fund, it's a bit like the performance-based fund I've mentioned under the mini-grid component. It's a results-based results -based financing sort of facility. So upon um, successful verification of the solar home systems that you claim to have deployed, uh, we will pay you a particular percentage. And the percentage ranges from between 7% to 20%. It, and this is dependent on the size of the capacity of the solar home system. Again, it's to make this business a bit more attractive to scale up this market, also to make it affordable to the end user. We're expecting that these end users are sort of going to be at the bottom of the pyramid as a ter in terms of access to finance, right? So we need to make it affordable for them as governments. And that's why we're providing these grant subsidies. With the market scale up fund subcomponent, um, unlike with the output based fund, we provide upfront funds, but this is based on submitting um, uh, a business proposal um, that clearly states how you, you seek to, to scale up significantly in the deployment of your solar home systems towards um, uh, increasing access to power for those in, 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 in rural communities. And before you can embark upon this subcomponent, you, should, you must have gone through the output-based fund subcomponent successfully. Um, at the moment, we've signed 12 grant agreements so with 12 companies. 
Um, we've deployed 85,697 solar home systems across the country. Um, and we've actually dispersed one, over 1 million US dollars to those suppliers. So any of you guys that are on this call uh, in the business of providing solar home system companies, please do reach out. My, my details will be provided by um, the energy talent company. Moving on to the next slide, please. Then we have the energizing education program. Um, I actually used to head phase one and I'll, I'll give you some uh, status update with regards to phase one of this, but this is where a federal government of Nigeria through the Rural Electrification Agency is powering 37 federal universities and seven teaching hospitals um, with, with captive solar hybrid power plants as well as uh, gas fired power plants as well for those, uh, for those universities that have access uh, to gas. Uh, the, first, the first phase dealt with nine universities, second seven universities, third phase eight universities. Um, under the Nigeria Electrification Project is focused on phase two and phase three. And that's why it says here, uh, 15 federal universities would benefit under the Nigeria Electrification Project and two teaching hospitals. Um, we have gone pretty far with the development of the uh, sustainability plan, the environmental and social impact assessment report, livelihood restoration plans, the front end engineering designs, all of the preparatory work. And um, we've also, um, uh, although it's not mentioned here, we've commenced or we've, we've issued out the initial selection document, which is like a pre-qualification uh, document where we ask companies to come and express, or it's almost like a request for expression of interest sort of uh, um, uh, document um, where we ask you to come and, and, and apply to, to participate as an EPC contractor in engineering, procurement and construction contractor. So unlike the first two components where I, where, that I mentioned where I spoke about um, developers having to, and suppliers having to bring their own counterpart funding and we only provide subsidies, under this component we're providing the full project cost because it's literally just an EPC. We're building these power plants for the universities. The universities will own these, universe, these power plants. And so it, they're going to generate the power for its own consumption. Okay. Um, yeah, so moving on to the next slide. So these are uh, the power plants that we built under energizing education phase one, uh, which I was personally um, uh, heading as the program manager at the time before taking over as the head project manager of the Nigeria Electrification Project. So uh, to your left hand top corner, to your left top hand corner, if that makes sense, uh, we built um, a solar hybrid power plant in Bayero University. Uh, this was the second to have been commissioned last year, September. It's been over one year and we've been able to successfully supply adequate power to this university. Yes, there were some teething issues in the beginning, um, first two months or so, um, as is the case with most new projects that have been embarked upon, especially in Nigeria, but uh, it, it's been pretty good ever since then. And we recently handed over uh, this, this project to the university, um, I believe last week or so. And then beside it, we have Federal University of Undufu Alike University. This was the first of the power plants, solar hybrid power plants that we commissioned. Um, in August of 2019, uh, we have successfully um, operated and maintained this plant for one year. The university have said that they've, they've made savings of 75% of their electricity costs and they've been enjoying this power. As well as you can see the training centers um, in, in these pictures where students have been given the opportunity to be trained in renewable energy courses and energy efficiency courses. And then to the far right hand corner, top corner, this is the recently commissioned um, power plant in University of Agriculture, Makedi, in Benue. We commissioned this last week, uh, which is the largest of all of them to date. Before it was one in Kano, now it's this one. Um, and actually we've been supplying power from this, this power plant to the university since July, and there haven't been issues, it, it's been well. Uh, and then to the, top, the bottom left-hand corner, University of Petroleum Resources in Delta. And as you can see, as I speak through this, we ensure that we cover at least a university in each geopolitical zone. Um, so one in Delta State, uh, which is set to be commissioned um, first quarter next year, Namdi Azikwe University, the same case, as well as um, uh, Abubakar Tafawa Balewa, and forgive me for my terrible pronunciation, uh, University in Bauchi. Um, these three are set to be commissioned in the first quarter of next year. Bauchi, actually, I must mention that 
we've actually been supplying power from this power plant to the university since, since January 2020 of this year. So as we're commissioning, politically commissioning this power plant in January, we're also going to be handing over the site completely to the university, having completed our one year of operations and maintenance. And then we have Osmano Dan for the university in Sokoto, which is uh, the, the training center is still under construction, but the power plant is complete. Now I've mentioned six geopolitical zones. So I'm sure some of you are like, I can't see Southwest here. Uh, university of Lagos and Obafemi, Obafemi Awolowo University in Oshun State are going to be um, benefiting from gas fired power plants up to eight megawatts. Um, uh, because I'm focused on renewable energy, that's why I'm, I'm just portraying these pictures. Uh, there is a long way for us, not a long way, but we're still in the implementation phase of, uh, you know, putting the um, uh, power plants or installing the gas fired power plants at those two universities. But hopefully before the end of, of next year, at least by third quarter, we would have um, hopefully completed uh, those projects. We've had a bit of financial constraints, so that's the reason for that. Um, next slide, please. And that concludes the presentation. I hope I was within, okay, I think I went over my 20 minutes. Um, but thank you, happy to take questions at the end. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anita. That was definitely very insightful. And we have a lot of questions here, which we will take at the end of all the presentations. Um, so we'll just go to the next slide and introduce the next speaker. So we have Sylvia, Ekrimet, uh, forgive me if, if that's not pronounced correctly. Uh, Sylvia Ekrimet is the business development manager of Daystar Power Group Ghana. She's an engineer and Commonwealth shared scholar and holds a master's of science degree with distinction in renewable energy engineering from the University of Central Lancashire, uh, United Kingdom. She also holds a Bachelor of Science in Electrical and Electronic Engineering from the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Ghana. She has been involved in science and technology engineering and science, technology, engineering and mathematics, STEM advocacy and mentoring of girls both in Ghana and overseas. She was a panelist for the International Women's Day organized by the High Commissioner of Canada in Ghana in March, 2020. She was also a keynote speaker for a mini MBA program focusing on eco-social enterprise for an all girls high school in Blackburn, UK in 2019. Sylvia, Sylvia is married and resides in Ghana with her husband and son. Um, so let's just have Sylvia take us through the second phase of the presentation. Thank you very much, Ugo, for the introduction. So like you mentioned, my name is Sylvia Ekremit, um, Business Development Manager for Daystar Power in Ghana. Um, so uh, before I, I take you through um, just a bit about myself, um, I reside in Ghana, like you said, um, I'm an engineer myself and I work with Daystar Power in Ghana. Next slide, please. So that's how I'm going to structure my presentation. I'll give a bit of introduction about Daystar Power and also the developmental stages that Daystar Power has been through. The challenges in the renewable energy business, um, current state of RE and recommendation. Next, next slide, please. Okay, so with regards to introduction, on Daystar Power. Um, Daystar Power was founded in 2017 by a group of experienced African and European entrepreneurs. Um, so the main focus of Daystar Power is to provide clean and reliable solar power to um, industries. Um, so for, for, we have about 200 plus systems across West Africa. So this shows um, the countries that we are operating in currently. So we, are, we have offices in Nigeria, we have two offices in Nigeria, we have one in Ghana, and also we, we have systems in Senegal, Togo, and we are expanding to Ivory Coast as well. 
So our main mission is to reduce energy costs for our clientele. We, we realize that um, in West Africa, most of the countries have very high tariffs. So that is the main focus of this part to reduce energy costs because re research has proven that companies spend about 20% of their operations, uh, operational costs on energy. So that's the main focus of Daystar Power. And also we provide clean, reliable and power, reliable power at monthly fee or no capex for um, our clients. We also include technology in our operations whereby we give clients full control over their power. So they're able to view and know what is happening. How much are they taking from the grid? How much are they taking from solar? Next slide, please. So you might want to know how do we impact West African businesses? So like I mentioned initially, we provide clean, reliable and affordable um, power to our clients. Solar is cheap. Solar is clean. And also in terms of technology, we allow the client to be able to monitor from the comfort of their homes. They can view it on their mobile phones, on their, on their tablets. They're able to see their consumption and how much savings they are making um, in a day, in a month, in a year. So in, in serving our customers, we, we look, these are where our, cast, um, our clientele Funds too. So we have industries, people have the perception that solar is only for residential, but we are, we are powering industries, gas stations, banks, agriculture, health, and education as well. As we go through the slides, you, you get to know some clients that we've worked for. So we, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we have um, presence in Ghana, Nigeria, Togo, and Senegal, and we are expanding to Ivory Coast, as I mentioned initially. Next slide, please. So in terms of how far Daystar has come, I mentioned Daystar was formed in 2017. So this is a clear picture of um, what we have, the faces, the different faces we've been through. So in 2017, that was when it was formed from Sun Ray Ventures. And from there, we, we, we've come a very long way. These are some of our clients. Um, we, we've installed systems for Echo Bank, Unity Bank, Access Bank. And in, so in 2017 to 2018, we installed about 40 plus systems. But currently we, we have about 11 megawatts of installed capacity, 200 plus systems. And we are moving on, to, I mean, looking at our pipeline, we are moving on to about 50 megawatts before the close of um, this year. And some of the clients we, we currently working with are United Nations, we have Standard Chartered Bank, we have Shell, Vivo, and quite a, a, a number of notable companies in West Africa. Next slide, please. So what are the challenges um, that we we faced in RE businesses? This um, is general, but I, I can limit it to um, as a company, based as a company. So there's lack of qualified skilled workers. I mean, I've sat in interviews where graduates come, they want to be in the renewable energy space and they hardly know much about renewable energy. So that is why we need a um, we, we, we need companies like Energy Talent to, to train people who are confident enough to bring value to renewable energy companies. And also solar is capital intensive. I mean, renewable energy is capital intensive. So the, the whole CAPEX model where the person has to pay for upfront, upfront purchase of, of the system is so unattractive. People also, like I mentioned initially, have this whole notion that uh, they are not sure. Will it really work? Is, is, is solar able to power so much load? So people wouldn't want to invest 
in, in, in solar, they, they would want to wait a bit. So the whole in capital intensive thing turns people off and they wouldn't want to invest upfront, but they would want to um, test the waters to know is it really working? But I mean, we've done for companies that are high energy intensive and th their track record shows. There's also lack of motivation for people to go into IRE. Like I mentioned, the knowledge gap is wide. People have heard of solar, they've heard of wind, but they actually don't understand. So that is why we need our universities um, renewable energy is pretty new, but we still need our universities. It's our universities to educate the students so that they will be able to come out and know what to do. I mean, when they come into industry and the government also has to sensitize people. So people are more inclined towards saving the environment. I mean, we, we have problems, we all have problems, but we can't say because we have problems, the environment sh should suffer. That is what we have. So the knowledge gap is, is, is a bit wide. So it, it makes it a, a bit of a challenge. People are highly motivated. Then also there's a lack of investment capital and financing. Local financing, the interest rates are not so good. I, I'm happy Anita was mentioning the I mean, single digits and all that for Nigeria. I, I wish we could have that in Ghana, but that's for another day, a conversation for another day. And also regulatory risk and unfavorable state policies. Um, we can have change of government and tariffs will increase, tariffs will reduce. All these things are risk that brings uncertainty in the business. Then grid constraints. So when we talk of grid constraints with renewable energy, we have um, two forms. We have the variable and non-variable or the dispatchable and non-dispatchable. Solar happens to fall within the, the, the variable because the resource is, um, the availability of the resource is not so stable. I mean, it, it depends on the weather. So, and also the location as well. So storage comes in, storage is expensive, all those things contribute to being it's being connected to the grid. We are not sure, but we know with um, the others like hydro, you, even when the demand is not so high, power can be stored and dispatched later on. But with, with solar, you need battery banks and all that. So there are bits of constraints. And I mean, in terms of technology wise, um, our grids, the grids that we have currently might not be so um, smart to be able to determine what to do, but I think we have a long way to go, but um, with time, we will get there. Next slide, please. So um, with the current state of doing RE business um, in West Africa, um, currently, according to the ECOWAX, um, we have, by 2030, we should have targets, IRE targets of um, 5 to 35% of energy and um, national energy or generation being from IRE. So in Ghana, um, we have a renewable energy master plan where our target is to have 10% of energy being produced from renewable, but currently we have, one, we are, we have less than 1% installed as solar, um, as renewable. So, and, and the whole target for 2030 is having about 26%. So in 2020, we gave ourselves 10%, but we have less than 1%, so, which means that there's a very long way to go. We have other countries like Nigeria, um, Senegal, who, which also have their targets set. And in the, among the ECOWAX countries, Benin, Benin um, doesn't have a target yet. So hopefully by 2030, they should have a target because I mentioned initially, the environment is what we have. It is not just about having access to electricity, but having access to clean, reliable electricity that will make our environment safe for us to live in. 
And the study also shows that 20% of operational costs is spent on energy, especially with industries. So hence, if we have RE that reduces cost, it makes it more attractive. I initially mentioned um, unfavorable government or state um, policies. So during the early stages of the COVID-19 is issues, we, we had the government reduce tariffs. I mean, it's a good initiative for people, but it comes down to what about businesses? Because in, in, in our business model, you are trying to reduce people's costs, cost of paying electricity, but there's, no, there's nothing like feeding tariff, which initially was, it was piloted um, in 2015, but put on hold. And recently it's been, it's, it's under implementation stage such that it will go through um, a tender process. So if you're a company and you produce renewable energy, you produce energy from renewable source, it should be offered um, a competitive price, but you have to go through bidding to, in order to get to that. And also for implementation of net metering, since the inception of Renewable Energy Act in 2011, there is excess capacity. Um, so if I should give a brief um, statistics of energy in Ghana, we currently have 5,000 megawatts installed. Our peak demand is 2,300 megawatts. So we have excess of close to 3,000 megawatts. So you, you would want to ask yourself, is net metering coming on or not? But that's for another discussion. These are the sort of policies that we believe that the government of Ghana needs to look into it so that it will make business also lucrative for us because um, net metering is, is a scheme that it makes it, which gives incentives for businesses and, and people who are into RE. Next slide, please. So um, recommendations, how, how do we ensure that RE businesses thrive? Um, so we, as part of the things that we can do, I mean, as, as government people, as, as individuals, things that we can push, even if it's advocacy, things that we can push. And um, we have the, if, if we can have, in terms of states, we, we should have tax abate abatement on RE equipment. Currently, if you are to import, we import most of the stuff that we use in building our systems because we don't have a local manufacturing capacity in, 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 in Africa, I mean, in Ghana specifically. So the taxes should be reduced on the equipment that we import because we are trying to make the environment safer for us to live in. Currently, it's only on solar panels that you have a bit of reduction, but other equipment, in addition to rebuilding a complete system, it is not. Then also local financing opportunities. I mean, the interest rates are very high. Local, there's, there's absolutely um, high um, local financing opportunities, even those that are able to offer, it's very low and um, the interest is very high. So it doesn't make business sense to go in for that. And also um, conducive regulatory framework. I mean, there should be ease of permits process in, in getting permits, even renewal of permits, it takes I mean, the, the, the number of days that they write on their websites, when it's time, it's, it goes beyond that. As a people, I believe if we really want to make things work, these are things that we could look into. And also, if we should have a purchase obligation for energy intensive um, industries, so industries that, are, that pollute the environment or industries that use so much energy, if governments can 
ensure that, okay, 10% or 15% of your power definitely comes from renewable. It will make RE businesses thrive because these companies wouldn't have any option than to um, employ renewable energy in their operations. Um, so with a third utility procurement policies, I've mentioned feed-in tariff where electricity generated from renewable energy sources are offered at a guaranteed price, which now it's competitive bid and so until you, you get through, you won't be able to receive that, um, that kind of um, scheme. And net metering, where energy generated from a site is used to offset the cost of electricity provided by the utility. So th this, this, is, this incentive would make a lot of people rush in for renewable energy, but it is not happening. But these are recommendations that I believe if they should be implemented, it will, it will help with the IRE business. And also proximity to markets. I've mentioned initially, hardly are we able to purchase stuff from um, the local market? Even cables that are manufactured um, locally tend to be more expensive as compared to importing them and in terms of the quality. That is why we need um, graduates who come out and, 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 and are very innovative and are passionate to be in the IRE space and make a change. So I think talent, um, energy talent company, we have some work to do here. Um, next slide, please. Okay, thank you very much. And I'll be open for questions. Thank you so much, Silvia, Silvia for that presentation. I'm sure there are uh, quite a number of questions, some of them coming in through the chat. Uh, again, we will take the questions at the end of all presentations. So please keep the questions coming. Um, so we will now go to our next and final, but not the least um, guest. Um, let's go to the next slide. So Uzo Mbamalu is an energy systems engineer and entrepreneur who specializes in designing and deploying sustainable, sustainable energy systems. Is the CEO and co-founder of Manamu's Electric. Uzo Chuku deployed his first solar energy system in the year 2020, 2012 while working for a solar company in Nigeria. In 2018, he was selected for the Mandela Washington Fellowship US Department of State's program during which he studied business and entrepreneurship at the University of Nevada, Reno. By 2019, Uzo Chuku and his team crossed the milestone of 100 solar energy storage solutions um, deployed across Nigeria. Currently, Uzo Chiku and his team at Manamu's Electric are building a factory that enables them to mass produce, deploy, and operate commercial agriculture storage system. These systems are 100% solar powered and ideal for productive use of energy application in off-grid environments. Um, so let's just have Uzo take us through the rest of it. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Uzo. Okay. Thank you, Ugo, for having me on this platform. I'm, I'm blessed to be a speaker alongside um, Anita and um, Sylvia. Um, like I told you, this is my first ever webinar, so I'm super excited um, to be here. Um, like he has already introduced, my name is Uzo Chukum Bamalo. I'm, I'm an engineer, being in electronic engineering from um, the University of Nigeria. Um, I started deploying solar energy systems back in the university. I used to work for one of the local um, solar companies. It's called Nio Tropical Technology. I think they're one of the they're one of the leading developers now in the country for mini grids and. That's basically where I built most of my um, energy talents. You know, um, I'm, re I'm really excited to be here because currently I feel the solar companies are the ones who are building the talents and the solar companies can only employ very few people. So energy talents company is able to bring in more people and do this at scale. So I'm excited and I'm blessed to be here. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so... Um, 
Yeah, this is basically my presentation is quite a short one. Introduction to Manamo's Electric Development Stages of Manamo's Electric Challenges and um, Opportunities. Um, we are still a, we are still a startup. Um, not as not at the level of um, Daystar, and um, so this is my team. Um, in the picture, um, the. The white people you see are friends whom I meet from during my time as a Mandela fellow in um, Reno. I, I, I built a lot of relationships and, some, and to, of course, I was basically tell, telling everybody about the work we do. So I came around to Nigeria to see the work we do and discuss possibilities of um, working together going forward. So this is basically my team and everybody's excited. This is our office and we are primarily from Enugu State and Nigeria. Next slide, please. Yeah. So um, about Melamo's Electric, we are an electrical and renewable energy startup, and we provide a complete suite of electrical energy efficiency and um, renewable energy offerings. Um, presently, our focus is efficient electrical systems, solar power solutions, and commercial cool storage systems. Um, of course, there's a, there's a lot a lot of areas we are interested in because the the um, clean energy industry is so vast. We are interested in biofuel. We are interested in mini grids. We are in, we're interested in, in solar in solar powered water boreholes. We're interested in a lot of stuff, but these are these are current um, present focus because basically we operate from a position from a position of strength. We do what we can, and when we build more capacity, we do more. And we are building on the shoulder of giants, and we draw inspirations from companies like Tesla. Of course, I'm I'm, an, I'm I'm a big fan of the work Tesla is doing, and not just Tesla, but companies who have um been doing this solar business before us and who have made the who have made it easier for us the younger ones who are coming up to be able to um to do more companies like Nayo, companies like cloud energy companies like green village electricity um companies like rent source energy these are most of these are nigerian companies who one way or the other we've had the opportunity to work for as a start to work for as a partner and definitely improve our experiences and um, and, um, and expertise. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, so um, stages of development. Um, of course, there are several stages of development of, an, of a startup or an energy business, um, which of some many of them, which I didn't mention here because we haven't gotten there, like the stage, like the stage of maturity, um, the state, the stage of expansion. These are these are these are stages which a lot of big companies have gotten to. But we just, we just um I just outlined the stages which I feel we have we have reached and um hopefully over the next few years we'll be able to to do some more. So um okay this is this pic the pic the, Im the image here the image here describes so this was, this was in 2016 when we just got started um it was uh, of course as a startup with young as a startup founded by young engineers it was easier to get electrical wiring projects where we basically did an energy efficient wiring and energy retrofits for clients. So this was in, this picture here was in 2016. That's my co-founder there. I think it was a residential home that needed a, a total um, energy retrofit. We basically replaced all the wiring with an efficient electrical wiring. Yeah. So yeah, next slide, please. Yeah. So financing during, um, yeah, one thing I, forgot, I didn't mention was I know this um, presentation revolves around policy, regulation, and um, finance. Um, personally, I feel Nigeria ha Nigeria has pretty good regulations. Um, you just you just have to build capacity. You just have to build um, capacity to meet up with a lot of these regulations. So, like I said, we we focus on what we can do. We focus on when we, when we build capacity, we do some more. So at this at the, at the at the at the seed stage um all at this at, at the seed stage our, our only capacity that we had was talent and luckily after working for after working for Nayo and my my, my co-founder also worked for another company we had talent as our capacity and that talent was our talent was basically what we were using to um get financing so this was me in 2016 this this pro the project with the project where you see me in front of that's me. Um, the project where you see me on a rooftop with lots of solar with some solar panels that was that wasn't a Manamo's electric project that was one of the bigger companies who basically call when they get project when they get projects and they do not have talent around there they call us and we go to deploy on their, on their behalf so 
that was that was a source. Then these are the other projects where you see me de deploying an inverter. That was for a friend. So that's so basically at the seed, at the seed at the seed stage, the easiest way to get financing that was for for us for us because prob probably our probably our, our biggest asset at that point was talent. Was basically outsourcing our talents to other people who had the capacity to get proper projects and um, friend, family and friends who decided to give us the chance. So next slide, please. Yeah. So during the growth and establishment stage, because of course the seed stage happened basically probably between 2016 and 2017, lots of freelancing and stuff. Um, 2017, we were able to make enough money to now start running a proper um, renewable energy business. And so our sources of our revenue streams began to increase, not just energy talent and um, that is fin financing for us. Like I said, I'm not really mentioning policy and regulation because we haven't really had to bother about that. Um, ex when when we when we do bigger projects like the mini grids, we are basically working for other companies who deal with the policy and regulation issues. So yeah. Energy talent was a sort of we, we still even to this present day we still outsource our talent projects of family and friends of course that still happens projects from referrals is still a sort of finance because definitely when you when you work when you execute a project properly the customer now refers you to the next customer and this, the growth has basically been um, organic um we which with um projects from RFPs. Of course, sometimes we we, we get in, we, we get asked to to submit applications for probably an institution or or an, or an organization like the street lights. The, the the image where you see our engineer set, setting up a street light. That's a Catholic church in Lagos. I think that's Catholic Church of Divine Mercy in like Phase One Lagos. And um, that's one of uh, we basically we, we put up a request for application. We put up a call. We put up. We applied and they gave us. I think that we had about we have about sixteen polls or there about there. Um, credit facility from suppliers. Um, of course, yeah, getting loans is really difficult. Or I think that, uh, yeah, getting loans is really difficult. But but the the, the suppliers of this project of this of the equipment you use, a lot of them are also eager to sell their products. And when they see you have a track record of making lots of sales for them, making lots of sales, it's easier to get them to give you perhaps maybe a thirty day credit facility. Probably, probably, of course, it becomes slightly more expensive. Maybe they charge they charge you very low, maybe two percent or three percent of the value of the products. So that helps you to have stock and helps you to execute the project. So something is something is something we we're, we're, we're able to get because of the track record built over the years. Then, of course, profits when you do, when you do projects and you get money, you try to reinvest it back in your your projects. So yeah, the, the other the other picture by the side is um, that's a four kilowatt system. That's also in, in Lagos, Nigeria. It's also a place called um, Osa London. So yeah, so that's basically how the sources of finance at this stage, which is basically what where where we we we, we are now. Um, we currently have a, a staff strength of about nine full time people, and we have about fifteen people who are on contract when we have projects and all. So next slide, please. Yeah, the innovation. Um, commercial cold storage solutions is something we started working on in January this year. Um, it was an opportunity we explored after interacting with lots of people in the in the local markets, and we and we realized that there's a real um supply chain problem. And we realized that about forty five to fifty percent of fresh produce that are harvested in Nigeria are never consumed. They essentially they are wasted. When the farmers harvest and they finally get to the market, the people at the market are able, are able to sell about half, half or less than half of the produce they get. Then they throw away the rest. They manage, from the half they sell, they manage to make enough profit, enough profit to get by, and they throw away the rest. So we realize that there's a need for um, resilient um, supply chains. So we began to we began to engage with a lot of stakeholders. Um, we engage with farmers, market sellers, vehicle drivers, and we, and we realize that. Okay, with um, fresh fresh goods need a need a cold chain. You don't just need a supply chain. You, you need a robust cold chain. And in the absence of that, the tomato, for instance, which could last up to 21 days, 21 days in cold storage, or considering the conditions under which they are stored and the conditions of um, our supply chain, the tomato could could get spoiled in in less than um, two days. So 
essentially Nigeria, Nigeria, you know, you know what that means. Nigeria produces about 2.3 million metric tons of tomato annually, and only about 1.2 million metric tons is consumed. And and these lo these, these losses can be mitigated. There's there's research to back it up that shows that with proper with a robot with proper like a proper and robust and cold chain, proper and robust cold chain from the from the farm to the market. Then that, that you can probably in, increase increase the profitability for farmers by fifteen percent, reduce wastage by fifteen percent, and so we, we felt we felt we felt it was a problem worth studying. Then there was also the issue of like during coronavirus, we saw we saw reports online of where how some of these people who sell these things have nowhere to store them at the close of markets. So some of, so so some of them store it in gutters, some of them store it in gutters, and um less than hygienic environments. We've, we've also done survey of the markets ourselves, and we realized that most of these produce you see in the markets, at night, they just cover them with leaves and, and go home and ask the security in the market to make sure nobody steals from them. So these things are basically outside, covered with leaves, stay. So it's the conditions for storage are less than, are less than, are less than ideal. And considering post-COVID post where people have to worry about um, what they eat, it's a problem that needs to be solved. So. We decided, to, we decided to start build, to start working on how can we build a network of solar powered cold chains. It's um it's a very bold project. Everybody we've, we've discussed it has said this is a very bold project and will cost you a lot of money. How are you gonna finance this? We said well we will try. So um our, the the sources of financing of financing which we are currently exploring, of course, profits from our business are being pushed into the cold storage system. We've, We've been able to acquire from our profits. We've been able to acquire land for our factory here in Enugu State. It's about seven plots of land, so it's quite a massive space for a proper factory. Um, fenced, fenced the land, completed our design, and hoping to launch our pilot, pro our pilot project by January. Um, not just of, not not just from our profit, not just from our profits. Anyway, we were able to explore, um, we were able to explore um, innovation challenges, like being able to. That's one thing, one thing I, I would want to mention. Information is key. Being able to be having information on when they are called for applications, for competitions, and innovation challenges. So I think this year we've been able to we've been able to win two already. Um, they've not been announced publicly, so I can't mention them here. Then there's also a, there's also a third there's also a third one which um there's also a third a third one which we've just passed through due diligence and we are we are expecting the confirmation this month. So. From the funding received from these um, challenges that we've won, we've, it would basically help us do a pilot of at least 11 projects in 2021. That's commercial solar powered cold rooms in markets across the country. Then impact investors. So we, we, we're talking to a lot of people, um, making headway, having, having important conversations. Um, I, I, was, I was fortunate enough to be a 2018 Mandela Washington Fellow. So it, it, it helped introduce me to a lot of people who are active in the energy space. And so lots of conversations have been going on. I've also had conversations with people in the, in the REA. And when I made my presentation to some of the folks there, I think that quite everybody, everybody agreed that this was quite a, a problem that needs to be solved. So next slide, please. Yeah. Um, okay. Before I address this slide, in the previous slide, I, I, I saw a pop-up on my screen where someone mentioned about energy storage is key for achieving a standalone solar-powered solution. Just to just to um, address just to address that, um, we are integrating cold thermal energy storage. Um, cold thermal energy storage basically has it basically means integrating an ice bank into the system. So the cold thermal energy, the, the ice bank, which is basically converting water to ice, then the ice can the ice is now used to cool the box. When in the absence of sunlight, the cold thermal energy storage can actually kill the, cool the cold room for about 18 hours, about 24 hours a day. But it, it's expected to do it for 18 hours a day. Then the sun cools for six hours a day. So energy storage is like the third option. Of course, this would do this would do matter much if you deploy it in a mini grid location. Because we're already having conversations with some of the mini grid developers. We already work for some of them in implementing projects. So the relationship has helped in, in talking to them about the projects. We are, the project we are. We are working on um, challenges. Of course, we see challenges. The, the number one challenge for in, in our business is affordability for customers. Most most customers cannot afford us upfront, 
uh, most customers cannot afford or rather afford solar equipment upfront. So it makes it it makes it difficult to get more people to go solar. So you have a lot of you have a lot of people who are talking to you, but very few people are actually going solar because of costs. Project and business finance. Um, project financing is where you 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 take you take up the upfront cost for the customer. Then over time, the customer begins to pay. And we haven't been we haven't started offering that yet because it costs money to do that. Business finance, of course, it's, it's, it's always challenging. You're always you're, you're always struggling to balance between the money coming in and the money going out. So it's some it's some and as, a, and as an engineer, your you your your background is not our background is not economics, but we have to start learning about finance and things that are, that are not exactly our forte. Then there's policy there's policy and regulation. Um, like I, it, it doesn't it doesn't affect it doesn't affect us much at this stage. Although, for instance, for a set up a factory, your product has to meet certain standards like um, like a man man cap, sun cap, some of those regulations. Yeah, so we 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 have that in mind. Then there are certain projects which, of course, we haven't been able we haven't we haven't been able to apply for directly. Like some of those projects, Anita Anita mentioned in her slide. Um, some of, some of some of the some of the requirements requirements cost cost money to meet some of the requirements cost money to meet so sometimes it's, it's, it's easier it's easier to just it's easier to just do do go go for projects that the that policies policy allows you to then wait till you i'm not saying those policy those requirements are but those requirements help make sure that people of a certain standard bids for certain projects well it means that we are taking our time before we start getting to to um, bid for some of those projects, we just don't bother. Then, experience and exposure. I feel like ex experience is experience is everything. I feel if I knew a lot of the things I know now in 2016, our business would have gone a lot further than it, than it presently is. Because when you are experienced and when you have information, you are able to leverage opportunities a lot a lot more easier. Especially financing opportunities. Um, in 2018, I went to I went to Nairobi for a training organized by the GIZ, the German Project Development Training Week. So you can see me at the rooftop. This is at Strathmore University. It's a 100 kilowatts grid type solution. Interacting with the engineers, they discussed about financing and how a lot of these things are done. Um, of course, also also being a Mandela Fellow, I was I was able to visit, go to I was in Nevada. I was in I was in the, I was in Nevada in the University of Nevada, you know, and the Nevada and the, the Tesla Giga factory is also in Nevada. So I was fortunate to also build relationships with engineers at Tesla, some of their business people at Tesla, some of the insights and experiences they gave also help open your mind to opportunities you can leverage. So I feel like the more expo information as well, the more exposure you have, the more your possibility to ask, to unlock um, financing. The decision, for instance, the decision to the decision to go into um, energy energy storage, I actually made that decision when I when I was in, in one of the Walmart um, distribution centers. When I noticed that the reason why Walmart Walmart is like the it's like the shop shop right of America. Yeah, so most people get their fresh their fresh produce. Most people get their fresh produce from Walmart, and I noticed that Walmart is able to achieve that fresh produce that they give because they have a distribution center that's full of several cooling systems operating at them different different temperatures so the the exposure to realize that okay this technology is possible talking to some of the engineers they made me realize that okay we can do something like this in nigeria even though at a small scale so in all regardless of all the challenges you face from project and business finance policy and regulation i believe most police issues with policy and regulation some startups have you're able to navigate it when you have access to um, more information profitability knowledge knowledge is also, is also key in you making the smartest business decisions for you from the products you, from the products you go after to the cost from the products you use to the customers you go after your strategy is basically knowledge and knowing what works and what doesn't work next slide please Opportunities we've explored. So we've basically been been exploring all the opportunities in as much as we now focus on the ones we feel we have a competitive advantage, like the off-grid cold chains, energy efficiency retrofits, inverters and energy storage solutions, hybrid and off-grid solar, solar home systems, mini grids. Of course, that our involvement with solar home systems and mini grids currently have been 
third party or over time i'm sure would we'll probably start exploring them directly it's basically depending on funds available you do what you can build capacity to some more next slide yeah thank you so my details are there you can always reach out to me on socials for further conversations and thank you very much for this platform i'm blessed to be here thank you Thank you so much, Uzo, for, for that very detailed uh, presentation. And I want to say a big thank you to all of the presenters. Um, so we are now open for the question and answer segment. Uh, I want to maybe open the floor with one question. I know Anita has already addressed some of the questions that came in the chat, uh, but I want to open the floor with one question. Um, Anita, are there specific you know, either uh, financing interventions or projects that are open to smaller business, uh, sort of what Uzo had alluded to, right? So while you are in the early stages of your, of your company, are there um, programs or interventions that businesses like that can go for that's not open to the bigger players in the industry? Yeah, under the Nigeria Electrification Project, as I mentioned earlier, um, with the mini grid, the solar hybrid mini grid component. Literally, the requirement is just that you have built one mini grid, and that mini grid is in operation. Um, I mean, it, it's small scale, right? They're not large projects like the Energizing Education Program, where we're talking about megawatts. With the mini grids, we're talking about, you know, 40 kilowatts or whatever. Um, so it's, it's definitely open to the smaller companies. And the truth of the matter is, if we made the requirements so high, we won't really have much local participation. And we're really trying to encourage, you know, local participation, local content um, in, in helping us achieve our targets. So uh, under the Nigeria Electrification Project, as it concerns the solar hybrid mini grid component and the solar home systems component that I'd also mentioned too. These are small companies, uh, not small, but, you know, up and coming companies. Um, for example, uh, Uzo had mentioned that he'd worked with Neo, Neo Tropical. Uh, it's doing very well, like it said, but it's also um, a very new company too. It's not a large company like um, Metka or Sterling and Wilson who built the Energizing Education Projects. Um, you know, it's a small up and coming um, organization too. So we're very, in a nutshell, we're very open um, to our smaller local companies are getting involved. They just need to have, they just need to be able to demonstrate that they've done it before. So with the solar home systems, for example, all I need to know is that they've deployed or they've sold a hundred systems and then they can get onto the platform. The idea is that we don't want to be just signing contracts with, with anybody, what, what we call brief, brief case holding uh, <laughs> individuals. Like, let's see that you've done it before by yourself, right? And we're not asking for a whole portfolio. Of, of project completed, but let's know that you've started something. So yeah, thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so I'll just go again. So we're now in the question and answer segment. So if you have questions for um, any of the speakers or a general question, please go through every question that's that's put down here. Um, so there's a question coming from Alex. Uh, I think it's for you, Anita. Um, Solar has not become the cheapest energy source. Is affecting this plant and by this plant in the presentation you made? Uh, is it making it easier for this project to be built? Uh, Anita, I think that's for you. So sorry, can you repeat the question? So he's asking, uh, with the trend of solar becoming the cheapest electricity source, um, is, it, is this making the, some of the projects you've outlined, is it making it easier to be built with solar becoming the cheapest electricity source, uh, source globally? Absolutely. Um, especially because most of these off-grid renewable projects are aimed at those in rural communities, right? So if it's super expensive, then eventually it will be passed on to the end user. So the customers, um, those in the rural communities and the villages, they will be expected to pay this very high tariff. So um, the cheaper uh, the components of, of these uh, mini grids and solar home systems, the better it is for the end user. And uh, it makes our, our 
projects more attractive as well. I mean, we're already providing subsidies, right, to address this issue. Um, but yeah, so yeah, in general, um, it, it definitely it definitely will be beneficial to the program and to the country as a whole. Thank you. Um, so this is for Silva, uh, Sylvia, sorry. Um, so Sylvia, okay is asking um, that West Africans have, and I guess for um, you as well, Anita, that West Africa have five to 35% renewable energy targets for national electricity. How do West Africa hold themselves accountable to ensuring that the target um, is met? And also are there opportunities for individuals to more or less influence their government or put extra pressure on their government to ensure the target is met? Okay, um, so to answer that, there is always sort of like a gap between implementation and target sets. So um, these targets were set somewhere before 2015. So for some of the countries, we have um, it broken down, let's say in 2015, this is how much their target is 2020, 2030. For Ghana, 2030 is 26%, 2020 is 10%. And we've not gotten there, there yet. But I believe it's the ECOWAX membership that owe each other that um, sort of like um, checking each person to make sure that they, they, they are within the target. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so I think Anita can help me here. Um, but in, in people um, betting the government such that they, they are able to uh, meet their target, I believe advocacy helps and we all have to have much knowledge about these targets and, and push that our government ensure that um, we, we, we are up, up for it. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, Anita, do you want to come in? How we can put pressure on the government to ensure we meet the targets? Um, sure. So, um, in order for us to be able to achieve um, its universal access or our targets, um, it, we need certain things to be in place, right? We need um, finances, we need data, we need the right legal framework, policies, regulations, and so on. Um, sorry, someone's got to... So sorry. All right, so as I was saying, you need, you need access to finance, you need the, regulatory, um, the right legal framework in place, and you need data, um, as well as political will. Um, so yes, we have these targets, do we have these aspects that I've just mentioned in order for us to be able to reach those targets? I believe we have the political will. I spoke about all of the regulations, all of the, the laws put in place, even trying to privatize the sector towards bringing in the much needed investment um, to, to be able to bridge the energy access um, deficit. We have um, all these financial intervention projects. I'm sure a lot of you were like, wow, I didn't know this was there, that was there and so on. Um, towards addressing the financial aspects. So not only are there um, grants available, there are also low interest loans. You know, Sylvia had mentioned that she was happy to hear that we have single digits um, interest loans. These aspects are being put in place because that's the only way we can achieve these targets. Um, the issue is, for me, I would say, uh, and this is why we need companies like yours, uh, Energy Talent Company, do we have human resources? So now we've made that the legal framework is there. Finan finances are being, financial support is being made available. Um, data as well, I mentioned data. We, we're working with SE for Rural, we're working with Frame, we're working with GIZ, a lot of other de development partners, NUMAP, et cetera, towards getting uh, data on where are those areas that need to be electrified? Um, do they have the ability to pay? What, what, what's their load demand like? You know, are they willing to pay and all of that information? We're working on that. But in terms of human resources, like building talent within the country, I have this project and it's funny, I, I, I'm lit I feel like I'm begging companies to participate, <laughs> you know, because it's not your typical government project where I'm saying I'm going to pay you 100%. If I say it's an EPC, everybody will be phoning my phone 24 seven. I'll be probably trying to hide somewhere. You know, but when I'm saying I'm just providing a subsidy, you know, and it's a grant though, 
I'm literally begging companies to come on board. And I don't know whether it's because we don't have um, many companies out there in this space. Um, I really don't know whether it's experience we're lacking, even though I've said you only have to have developed one mini grid or, de or deploy the hundred solar home systems. I don't know what it is, but we definitely need to work on internal capacity in order for us to help ourselves get out of this, this energy access um, drama that we're in. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Can I add something to what Anita said? I also believe that um, if we can collaborate, I mean, as um, renewable, renewable energy companies, that could also be a means where we can push the government. And also, as ECOWAX members, um, learning from each other. I mean, there are policies Anita mentioned. I'm, I'm here and I'm smiling that, wow, we could also, as a country, learn from each other so that we will be able to meet this target. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you, thank you Sylvia. Um, Uzo, I think this is for you. Um, Moses is asking for the solar powered cold room systems. Affordability of the services by the customer is the major challenge. Considering where the systems will be deployed, majority of the customers might not be able to afford it. Um, how, do you, how are you able to navigate that as you build your business? Okay, um, the nav the nav because of course the solar code rooms are not cheap. Um, each code room, each code room could co could cost up to ten thousand dollars to deploy. So our strategy for solving this issue is um, cooling as a service. There's this business model that's beginning to become popular in the cooling industry, cooling as a service service slash um desabitization model where manufacturers build products and they allow people, users to pay for it over time. And we were, we've been doing some financial modeling with the good people at um, Cross Boundary Advisory. And we realized that it would take about two years for each code room to become profitable because each of our code rooms has about um, 75 baskets. It's, the baskets are 25 kg baskets. So user, users can pay for the baskets about 100 Naira a day. That's less than 25 cents. And then the users pay about 100 naira a day, and there's 75, there's 75 of them. Over a, over a two year period, the system tends to pay for itself. So we believe that the people in the rural areas should be able to afford 100 naira a day because 20, the average price of um, one kg of, let's say, tomato, tomato is our target um, produce because about 60% of the fresh produce of the fruits and vegetables produced in Nigeria is actually the tomato. So one kg of tomato, the price, the average price cost of one kg of tomato is roughly three hundred naira. So twenty five kg, twenty five kg of tomato is over six thousand naira. So when you are sp spending hundred naira a day to pro to preserve the value of what you of what you are selling, it still makes economic sense. So that's how we make it affordable. The the users pay for the baskets. Thank you. Thank you very much, Uzo. Um, we are. Almost we're at time actually, but maybe we have a chance for one more question. Um, so I'll take this question from Husseini. Uh, he says, is there any plans by the government to subsidize battery prices? Uh, I think that that's one aspect of renewable energy components that require major attention. Well, I would, I would think that by subsidizing the entire thing, they're subsidizing battery prices. But then Anita, I don't know if you have other uh, response for Husseini. Okay. Um, yes, you actually answered correctly, uh, Ugo. Um, but at the same time, um, because we're now, when we now have this solar power Niger program that's also known as the 5 million solar connections um, facility program, where we are providing loans to companies to build manufacturing and assembling plants um, for PV panels for batteries, inverters, and the likes. Um, we're hoping this should reduce the cost um, of these components, including batteries. But I don't I, honestly, I don't know how long it will take us to get to that point. Um, it, it's it's I guess federal government making the efforts to try. Um, but yes, as uh, Ugo had mentioned, the, the subsidies that we're providing to private sector companies to deploy solar home systems and install mini grids and the likes. It's to essentially cover 
um, a certain percentage of the entire project. So it includes all of the components, PV panels, the batteries, the um, inverters, the diesel gen sets, if that's part of your, your design and, and so on. Thank you. Yeah, then please let me make let me make a mention to technology. There are certain solar energy installations or designs that are not heavily reliant on the batteries. Um, like we have the solar powered boreholes where the solar works during the day and the tank reservoir now acts as a form of storage. Solar boreholes usually pay for themselves in about a year because they it's, it's barely um, reliant on on batteries. We are now have we are now even beginning to have solar inverters that work mainly during the day, especially for companies that operates during the day. So the, depending on the application, you could, rely, you could rely less on batteries and that would basically help you overcome the issues of expensive batteries. Because I would like to think solar panels are already affordable. So sometimes the engineers can also help in reducing the issue of stacking excess batteries in your location. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, and thank you so much for that, Uzo. Um, so yes, so we finally come to the end because we are at time, uh, but I want to thank all of our guests who, who've made time to make, give us such an insightful presentation. Um, if you have further questions, um, you can reach out to us and we will send this question to them. So, so maybe you can go to the next slide. Um, please send us an email or reach out to us uh, through any of our, our social channels. Right, and we'll, more, we, we'll be more than happy to push these questions to any of our guests. Um, thank you so much for listening. For those who are interested in a career in the solar industry, uh, you can apply by going to our website, www.energytalentco or energytalentco.com. Um, or if you are a solar company and you're looking to hire very well trained professional talent, please reach out to us as well. Thank you so much um, for being a part of this. Thank you so much to our guests for such insightful presentation. And till we meet again, Merry Christmas in advance and a Happy New Year. Same to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.